Amen. 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 Well, praise his Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, Jesus said, out of our hearts will flow rivers of living water. He touched me and made me whole. And the joy just keeps on flooding and flowing. Amen. And uh, we're filled with joy in this place today. Take your Bible and turn with me to James chapter 2, verse 26. And uh, that, that, that is where we're taking all of this from in the book of James, verse 26. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. We've underscored this. It is faith, but your faith can be dead. And if you look around the landscape of the church today, you'll understand that we are loaded with dead faith. It's sort of like dead skin on the body. It's still skin, but it's dead. And it needs to be gotten rid of. So the, the, the question that we're going to begin with today is a bit of a review, but it's, so you have a dead faith. What do you do to revive a dead faith? How do you breathe life into this dead faith again? Because faith is faith, and it's the real gift of God. And God doesn't give cheap things. Your faith is the greatest thing you have. It is the apparatus that God's put in you. It enables you to believe everything he tells you in his word. That's a remarkable gift. And, and you will agree with me. We believe everything that's in this book. And it's because of this gift of faith. It is the greatest gift you have. And what a tragedy it is to have a dead faith. A dead faith is of no use. It's of no value whatsoever. And uh, it, it needs to be revived. It's not, it doesn't need to be done away with. It just needs to be brought back to life. And that's our mission. So I want to go over uh, a number of ways. There are four in particular, four ways that you bring your faith back to life. And I want you to begin by turning to Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. All of these four begin with R. That makes it easy to remember. I'm glad when we can do that. So uh, I think you'd do well if you just jot these things down so later on you can meditate on them. We go to Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, and we meet with, with the saddest, I think, of all of the churches in the book of Revelation. And it's the church at Sardis. And the Lord said, I know your works, and I know you got a reputation that you're alive, but you are dead. That is our Lord's judgment against an entire church. Now, we understand that doesn't necessarily mean every single living, breathing one in the church, but it is so widespread that... It is a good characteristic, a good way to characterize that church. It, it looked like everything was dead. And that's our Lord's judgment against that church. So we're going to find the first two ways to resuscitate a faith as found in verses 1 through 3. And the first one is remember. He says, remember. Remember from which you've fallen. Remember what it was like when you started out. Remember what it was like. When you confess faith in Christ. When all of a sudden you saw Christ as the Redeemer. As the only Redeemer. You saw Christ not only as a Redeemer. You saw him as, for who he is. Emmanuel. God with us. You saw Jesus Christ as God in the flesh. And as your Savior. And as your friend. He says remember from when you have fallen. Remember. Now, faith is a wonderful gift, but so is memory. I've run across a few people that have no memory. Mine seems to be fading away. <laughs> uh, a lot of older people have trouble with memory, and we know a lot of all pace, Alzheimer's patients, and probably you got some in your family, that uh, just don't remember anything. Uh, they can't carry on a conversation about anything in the past. They just don't remember. I walked down the hall uh, in Anderson one day with one of our members at Second Baptist in Belton and I was just making conversation with her as I walked down the hall and I said uh, well Lorraine how many uh, how many children do you have she thought for a minute and she said I'm not sure I know I have some but I'm not sure and I just didn't know how to respond to that and she took a few more steps and she said you know not too long ago, somebody wrote down all of their names on a piece of paper and gave it to me, but I've lost it. 
Is that not sad? How much sadder is it that a person can actually forget that they are redeemed? Forget that they have a Savior. And this Savior is the Lord God Almighty. He is God in the flesh. Peter deals with this. Now, I want you to hold your place. If you want to turn to, to, to Peter, uh, you can hold your place here because we're coming back to Revelation. But just let me read this verse to you. You can jot it down. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 9. For whoever lacks these seven qualities, because Peter has just finished giving seven qualities of a believer's life, and he said, whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Did you know that's in your Bible? The scripture tells me that it's possible for a believer to forget who he is. It's a kind of spiritual Alzheimer's. And how much more severe is that? That a believer can actually forget the Redeemer. He can forget the Savior. He can forget God. It's as if God doesn't exist. Oh, he knows he does, but it's as if he doesn't. He just, it's just not in his memory bank. It's a sad, sad thing. And I, I doubt that there's anybody here today that has that problem. But here's, here's what I want you to see. If you're not careful, that can happen to you. You can die forgetting who you are. I think I've buried a lot of people who didn't know who they were spiritually when they passed. They died just like everybody else. What a tragedy. What a sad thing. Now, let's go back to uh, Revelation chapter 3. The second of repent. He says, remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. How do you resuscitate a dead faith? Not only by remembering who you are and remember what the Lord has done for you. You resuscitate it by repenting. That's turning around. The word actually means to do a 180. It means you're headed north, you turn and you head south. You're headed west, you turn and you're headed east. It's a total reversal of how you're living. It, it, it's, it's to get back into your memory, the Lord, on a daily basis. So every day he is a part of your life. This is what Paul meant when he said that we are to pray continually. We're, we're to be in an attitude of prayer. And that doesn't mean you're in a prayer closet on your knees praying to the Lord. It means you're communing with him. Good things happen, and immediately you give him praise. You say, thank you, Lord. Bad things happen, and you say, Lord, you're in control. You're in control. I know you have a purpose in this. Something's going on here. I'm looking to you. I'm trusting in you. I'm leaning on you. This is the way we are to live every single day. And in those quiet moments when there's nothing in particular great going on and there's no tragedy or no trouble going on. You just have those quiet moments where you sort of get a break and you rest and your mind immediately goes to the Lord. And you begin to look around and see how the Lord's blessed you. You begin to count your blessings. You say, oh, that's a little hyper. No, my friend, that is the life of a Christian. I'm not going to walk you through this right now, but this just comes to mind. We, we need to understand this. Everybody in this room is not a Christian. Everybody in this room may be saved, but everybody's not a Christian. You can be saved and not be a Christian. Now, let me explain that. We use the word Christian all the time. As a matter of fact, when we meet people, we're going to witness to them. Usually, the first thing we ask them is, are you a Christian? And most of the time, it doesn't matter who it is. They'll say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And you say, tell me about it. Well, they've joined the church, and they've done a few things, you know, and they call themselves a Christian. And they may be living like the devil. We, we, we call anyone who says they're saved, we tend to call them a Christian. Your Bible does not do that. Did you know that in your Bible, the word Christian is only mentioned three times in your Bible? Twice in the book of Acts and once in Peter's letter. One time, it says the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. And before Felix, he said, Paul, all 
most you convinced me to become a Christian. And then Peter says, if anybody suffers as a Christian, let him rejoice. It's only three times Christian, that word Christian appears in your Bible. What that tells me is that there's a small group of people who are Christians. What is a Christian? A Christian is a person who is saved, of course, who is born again, who has a good testimony of their being born again, but they are actually fleshing out the Christ life. They are seeking every day to live like Jesus, to follow his teachings, to, to remodel their life, to clean up their life, to get sin out of their life, to loathe sin, and to get righteousness into the life, to quit doing frivolous, stupid things and start serving the Lord with good things and doing the good works that we've talked about. And that person is a Christian. You understand why there's so few Christians in the church? reason we have so little influence in the world today. Because most believers are not Christian. You can't look at their life and say that person is a Christian. Because in Acts, the reason they got the name to begin with is because they were all acting like this one that was crucified in Jerusalem. Oh, he's a little Christ. It was a derogatory term. They had married that because they had become what people call, quote, holier than thou, unquote. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's just one of those little Christianettes. That, that's probably the word we would use today. So, you, as a believer, must repent. If you're not living that Christian life, you've got to repent of that. And you've got to turn 180 and go in the opposite direction. I hear people say, and we've had a discussion in theological circles about lordship salvation. And there, some people say, uh, you, you, you need to make Jesus Lord of your life. Can I tell you, you can't make Jesus what God has already made him. You can't make Jesus Lord of your life. If you're born again, he is the Lord of your life. God made him the Lord of your life, the master. God put Jesus on this earth, the second person of the Trinity, and made him your master. You can't make him what he already is. And you're not to do that. So you say, well, what are you to do? You are to honor him as your master. That's what you're to do. You don't push him aside and treat him like a common, ordinary friend. No, you honor him. You, you obey him. His word. This is the concept of a master and a slave. Not all slaves had good masters, but here's the deal. Not all masters have good slaves. A lot of masters had slaves, and they just would not take orders. They just would not. And at best, in the old times, a, a master would sell that slave. He'd get rid of that slave, take him to the slave market. Didn't want him in his employment anymore. And so, you must honor him as your master. And a master controls everything in your life, and he controls it every day. It's not just a Sunday thing. We're here on a Sunday to do just exactly what we're doing. Take the scriptures and open the scriptures, expound the scriptures, and learn biblical truth and instruction and apply it to our lives. But Monday through Saturday is our lab. If you went to high school and you took uh, biology, you had a biology lab. And what you do in the lab, you put into practice what you learned in the classroom. This is our classroom today, and your lab is out there. And you go into lab when you leave here. And God's going to give you an opportunity to put into practice what you're taught today from his word. And if you do that, at that moment, you're a Christian. Now, you may fail miserably. You may not do too well next week or the next. I failed a few labs, but I passed the course. And that's what you want to do. So you keep on going. You don't go out and fail a few times this week and then just throw in the towel and quit. That's what the devil wants you to do. 
Because when you go out with the right attitude and you do fail, the devil's going to whisper in your ear and say, see there, see, see, you can't do this. Other people can do it, but not you. You're just not strong enough to do this. You have to renounce that and say, Jesus is my strength. And you get up and go again. And I'm going to tell you something, friend. You get to go through the same lab every week. And it gets easier and easier and easier. Now, it never is a piece of cake, but it will get easier. And you'll begin to see that here is a life that is manageable for you. That is repentance. Repentance is not just coming down an aisle with some tears in your eyes and making it. That's not, that's not the real repentance. The real repentance is when you walk out the door. That's the real repentance. What is it somebody said a long time ago about Pentecostals? It doesn't matter. It uh, doesn't matter. How high you jump when you shout. Uh, there's an old saying about that, but I remember the last line. What really matters is how straight you walk when the shout dies out. How straight do you walk? So that's repent. Have you got it? All right. Let's move on to number three. Report. Now we're going to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. We're through in Revelation. The third R. Report. What? Report for duty. Report for duty. Now, let's look at these seven characteristics that Peter mentioned just a moment ago. If you have these seven, then you'll, you, you, you will never fall. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Make every effort to supplement your faith. Make every effort. How would you interpret that? How would you understand that? Make every effort. Well, you just need to think about that. How, how are you going to interpret that? Let me tell you how I interpret it. Work really hard. Work at it. The life of a Christian is hard work. You've seen that. We went through in Ephesians chapter 4, the works. And friend, they are hard. But when the going gets rough, what happens? Jesus comes right along beside you. Puts his arm around your shoulder. Lifts you up, says, come on, let's go. And he walks with you. You just got to report for duty. He says, make every effort to supplement your faith. God gave you this apparatus to believe, but you are to build on that faith. It is the first building block. It is the foundation. He says, supplement your faith with virtue. And that's better than morals. That, that's, it's, it's actually... Moral righteousness. It, it's better than morals. You know, even thieves have a code of morality. The mafia has a code of morality. They have a morality. You don't say anything about my mama. That, that's a code of morality. Or you don't do what you're supposed to do and you'll lose your head. That's morality. And you don't rat on another mobster. That's a morality. Our prisons are full of morality. But this is something different than that. It's virtue. It, it's moral excellence. And what is moral excellence? Only that which God approved. So you should make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge. And knowledge with self-control. And self-control with steadfastness. And steadfastness with godliness. And godliness with brotherly affection. That's phileo. Like the city of Philadelphia. It's not working out real well for them right now. And brotherly affection with love. And that's agapeo. Not only do you care for your neighbor and your brother and love them with phileo, with brotherly love. You love them with agapeo, which is a love that does not have to be reciprocated. You love just for the joy of loving, and that's God. He loves us even when we are wicked and vile and disobedient. That's his steadfast love. It's agapeo. God doesn't love us because of what we do. He loves us because he has chosen us and set his love upon us. And brotherly affection with love. Because, this is verse 8, because, that's what the little word for means, 
Because if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, you have a live, breathing, active faith. It is not dead. And then we've come to uh, the fourth R. And that is reject. What are you to reject? Well, we found out about that in our works message from Ephesians 4. Probably do well to go back and listen to it again. You know the best way of learning, don't you? It had to change. Still the same in school, everywhere in college. It's the best, best method of learning is what? Oh, come on. Do I need to say it again and again and again? What's the best way of learning? Repetition. 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 And it's amazing. You've got four Gospels that take up maybe about that much in your Bible. But if you boil it down to everything that was said one time, it's about that thick. You probably read it in 30 minutes, all four Gospels. But what do we have in the Gospel? Repetition. Each one's repeating what the other one has said. Why? Because the Lord built us that way. And so we just keep on doing those things and we learn. Reject what? Reject the passions of the flesh. Listen to Matthew 16, 24 through 27 one more time. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. There it is. <clears throat> let him deny himself. I do not like to do that. I don't like to do it. I failed the last night. I went to boobies. <laughs> And my passions of the flesh say, eat all you can hold. And I did. And I suffered for it. Matter of fact, I got up this morning suffering for it. So I'm not going back to booties in a while. Somebody made this mistake of telling me if you'll ask the waitress, they'll, they'll go get something off the counter and bring it to you. And I, I did. Uh, and it worked. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, if anyone would be my disciple, in other words, if anyone would be a Christian, if anyone wants to be a Christian, why wouldn't you want to be a Christian? You say you are. I know you do. And why do you say that? Why wouldn't you just say, well, not really. I'm, I'm, I'm just a believer. I've been born again. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. And that's, that's good enough. And nobody ever tells me that. So we, we, want, we really do want to be Christian. Jesus says, here's the way you do it. If you want to be a Christian, you must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. And a cross has one purpose and one purpose only. This is it. One purpose. It's made to die. When you put on a cross, you don't come away from it. You die on that cross. That's the whole purpose of a cross. And you've got one to die on. And what is it? It is yourself. So you are to take up your cross and follow him. And this is not for you and you and you and you and let's see. Over here. You and you. That's the way we like to look at it. It's for everybody in the room. It's for all of us. This is not for preachers, not for missionaries, not for a deacon, it's not for Sunday school teachers. Not for, it's for everyone. And we understand that, don't we? I know you wouldn't do it if I, if I asked you to, but there's nobody in this room would stand up and argue with that. There's not a person in this room who stands up and say, well, my mate, I, that's not right. You don't have to do that. No, you're right. You don't have to do it just to be a believer. But if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you're going to be a Christian, you do have to do this. Can you imagine what Franklin County would be like in this week if everybody in this room went out and actually lived a Christian life? Everywhere, in every single dealing you had, you were Christian. It wouldn't be long to a County Baptist Church to have a reputation, not of being dead, 
But those churches have a reputation with the lie. There's just something about those people in Canada. It's weird. They're, they're not like other churches. They're not like other people. You make a decision. You want to be a living church or you want to be a, like a dead church? And I'll tell you, if, if everybody just sort of changed, I don't think uh, it'd be hard to find a preacher. I think this would be a preacher that church would be a church that preachers would be dying to get asked to come. Yeah, I've heard about those people at Ken. Oh, I'd love a chance to pastor that church. Yeah. I'll leave this church in a New York minute to go pastor those people because they're Christian. And you say, well, if it was Christian, we wouldn't need it. Oh, no, 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 no. No, Christians need it. I'm a Christian, but I need this too. Why? I need to be reminded, if I'm not careful, I can forget who I am and what God has called me to. And I don't want to do that. So, reject the passions of the flesh. Listen to Paul in Romans 15, 1 through 3. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let, no, let, let each one of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. And verse 3, Romans 15, 3, for Christ did not please himself. We are basically in the church today self-pleasers. Almost everything we're about is self-pleasing reason you have so many conflicts in churches because it didn't go my way. I didn't get my voice. They didn't do what I suggested. They didn't honor me for what I did. And Lord, you know how hard I worked to do that. And, but I got nothing out of it. Nobody said you did a great job. So I'm just going to quit. You see, if, if, if you're a God pleaser, it doesn't matter where you get praise or not. I never walk out these doors. I never walk out these doors on a Sunday morning or Wednesday when I'm moved by compliments because I didn't come here to please you. My only question when I walk out those doors is not did I please the people at Canada, but did I please you, Father? Were you pleased? I don't want to get in my car and drive down the road with some sense that God was pleased with what I said this morning. Now, those are your four words. You got them? Remember, repent, report, and reject. All right? I believe I can finish this up in about an hour and ten minutes, so hang with me. <laughs> so, what is it that you're going to get from this hard life? Don't you think you ought to get something out of living this hard life? If you deny yourself, if you die to self, wouldn't you think you'd get something out of that? You know why you think that? Because God put that into your mind. We all expect to get rewarded for hard work. We don't do hard work. If you grow in chickens, when those trucks pull away with all of those loads of chicken out of those three or four chicken houses, and you put sweat into all of that, and you got to get ready for another crop. If you don't, if you knew you were not going to get a check from that company, would you clean the house out and get ready for the next crop? You would not. You would not do that. God has put it in us. Don't try to improve on what God has done. How about that? People say, y'all do it just because you love the Lord. Well, that's certainly true, but don't try to improve on what God's done. God has said, if you'll do this, you'll get this. If you'll do the hard work of being a disciple of Jesus Christ, of being a Christian, you will get rewarded for it. And there's four words I want you to take away from this. And I'm going to go through them pretty quickly. And I may have to come back next week and give a further explanation of them, particularly number one. What are you going to get out of this hard work of resuscitating and renewing your faith? Number one, future salvation. Future salvation. 
There are two salvations talked about in the scriptures in the New Testament. You may not know that. There are two salvations. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Though you have not seen him, though you have not seen Jesus Christ, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Verse 9. Make sure you underscore this in your Bible. Obtaining the outcome of your faith. God expects an outcome of your faith. You grow chickens, you expect an outcome of that, of, of that process. God put faith in you, he expects an outcome. So, if you do all of these qualities that we talked about, this is the hard work. He says you will obtain the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. <coughs> Here's the deal. It's very clear in Scripture. The Scripture does not confuse spirit and soul. The word spirit is the word pneuma, and it actually means breath. A pneumatic tire contains breath. A balloon is pneumatic because it's filled with air. It's breath. And this is a picture of life, real life. If you're not breathing, you're dead. So the spirit is dead when we're born. And the Holy Spirit brings it to life when we're saved, when we're born again. He breathes his breath into us by the Spirit of God. And we become living spirits. We are the just men. Uh, we are, we are uh, can't think of my verse. We're, 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 we're just men made perfect yeah, by the Spirit, our breath. The word soul is the word suke, in which we get psychology, and that's obvious. That's the study of, how, of a person's behavior, of how they live. In other words, psychology is the study of how you live, this living person actually lives their life. And this all has to do with the millennial reign of Christ. You are saved in your spirit. God saved your spirit. You couldn't have done that because you're dead in trespasses and sins, right? You couldn't have saved him. No way you could save yourself. Because a dead man can't do that. God has to do it. But then when God saves you, he says, okay, I brought you to life. Now here's a way to go live. And that's your soul. And that is your responsibility. You control your soul. And you are to present your soul to God. In other words, you are, to, you are to live the life of a believer. Now, when are you going to realize that fully and completely? In the millennial reign. And so if you do the hard work, you're going to get to live with Christ for a thousand years. Unhindered. You're going to be just like him. That's the salvation of your soul. Now, I hope you understand. I hope you see that you must obtain that. You do that. And you do that by cleaning up your life, by doing the hard work. You'll obtain the salvation of your soul. Concerning this salvation, that's 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Concerning this salvation, he doesn't need to be talking about that salvation when you were born again, because he's writing to people who are born again. He said, now let's talk about this next salvation, concerning this salvation. The prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. They couldn't figure it out. That's the reason they didn't think about life on the, this planet. They thought about life in the third heaven where God is. They, 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 couldn't, they couldn't grapple with this. Listen to Hebrews chapter 1. Beginning in verse 14. Hebrews 1, 14. We're going to read through chapter 2, verse 5. He says, Are these angels not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Wait a minute, Paul. We already have salvation. He said, Yeah, but there's the salvation to inherit. 
Are you with me? You see it? It's clear, isn't it? What else could it mean? The salvation that you are to inherit. The angels you sent out to minister to us. We have angelic hosts around us. We have angelic help. Helping us to do what? To inherit salvation. That's the salvation of your soul. Not the salvation of your spirit. They're sent out to those who are to inherit salvation. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift away from it. Verse 2. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It's a twofold salvation. It's not only saved from something, that's our spirit. We're saved from destruction. We're saved from hell. But there's another aspect, and it's what we're saved to. And that's the salvation that Peter's talking about. Concerning this salvation. And Paul and Peter on the same page. He said, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to his will. This is all that God has done concerning this salvation that they could not see in the Old Testament. And most people have neglected in this present day church. It's not even on the radar of most people. But there it is. And I welcome anyone to show me how this is not right. This is not a proper interpretation. I welcome anybody to, to help me with that. So he says, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders. Verse 5. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come. The world to come. The world is always an earthy word. It has nothing to do with the third heaven. There is no world in the third heaven. This is the cosmos. The world. It's the planet. And it is not going to be done away with. It is going to be made new. Revelation chapter 20. Jesus said, Behold, I make all things new. This earth is going to be made new. And you and I are going to be a part of that world. Jesus spoke of the world to come. Matthew chapter 19. The disciples said, Lord, well, Peter said, Lord, he's learned a lot since then, right? He said, Lord, what are we going to get out of this? We left everything to follow you. We denied self. We denied our passions. We, we, we've left everything to follow you. Man, we're ready to die with you. We, we're, we're crucified with you. What are we going to get out of it? And Jesus said, Okay, Peter, let's talk about it. In the new world, when the Son of Man sits on his throne, and then he tells them what they're going to get out of it. Our God is so great, isn't he? So wonderful. This is that wonderful salvation. And that's why we can sing worthy, worthy, worthy and wonderful are you, Lord. This is what the Lord has provided for us. And I'll give you the others next Sunday. How about that? So it gets, it, as uh, there, was, there was an old Nazarene preacher that had a speech in Bethlehem. And he was known for saying, it just gets dooder and dooder and tweeter and tweeter. 
Bud Robinson. Hadn't been many Nazarene evangelists, but he was one. And he was on to something, wasn't he? And I want to say that again. Fred, be here next Sunday. Because he's just dooter and dooter and tweeter and tweeter. <laughs> and get into the Word. Amen? Amen? This is all in our Word. It's all in our Bible. And it's put there for us. And the one thing I am absolutely, totally convinced that is affecting the church today to be so weak and anemic is we don't have that hope. We don't know why we're doing all of this hard work. We don't know what we're going to get out of it. All I ever hear is what's going to heaven. Well, what is heaven? Oh, it's in the book of Revelation. Oh, wait a minute. You're talking about something on earth there. You just wait till we get there. And by the way, that's on Wednesday night. We're in Revelation 18, this coming Wednesday night, dealing with the fall of Babylon, which is actually a euphemism for the city of man. But when we get to chapter 19, Babylon's gone. Babylon has fallen under the rule of the Antichrist. Babylon the Great has fallen. It's a world system. And the Lord has stepped in. Brought the battle of Armageddon to a close, and he's establishing his kingdom. And he comes with the armies of heaven. And you and I are destined to be in that, in one of those armies of heaven. Right now, we've got, in our country, we've got what the army, we've got the Air Force, and we've got the Navy. Those are the three primary branches of the army, right? And in the, in, in the book of Revelation, in the world to come, there are three particular armies. The saints of the Old Testament, the saints of the church, and the saints of the tribulation. It's amazing. Three. Hmm. And uh, we, 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 we're getting close to some really good stuff. And let me tell you something. When I get through with Revelation 22, verse 21. You're going to have a total different respect for the book of Revelation. What I'm going to teach you from the Word of God, as the old saying goes, is going to blow your socks off. I'm so anxious to preach this and to show you from the Scriptures, just like I'm looking forward now to next Sunday. <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to preach next Sunday, but now I do. <laughs> and I'm telling you, it is that you can't imagine how much fun this is to take the Word of God and say that. There it is. There it is. And that matters to you. Now, there's some in this room, I fear, who are wanderers. I fear that some in this room have wandered from the Lord. Could it be that today you're coming home? I've wandered far away from God. Now, it's time to come home. The paths of sin, too long I've trod. But now, Lord, now, I'm coming home. I believe there's some prodigals in this room today. And the prodigal was a saved person. He's a picture of a saved man. He knew who his father was. He had squandered his father's riches. And he came home to apologize to his father. And his father was waiting. It's not a picture of an unsaved man. It's a picture of a wandering believer who finally came to his senses and he said, I know what I'll do. I'll go home. Wouldn't you like to go home today? Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for my friends and these are my friends and it's been such a joy to rekindle friendships and to see the families that have come out of the friends that we've cherished. But Father, it's like every other church I know, all is not well. And there are some here this morning who have been wandering, and there, there are many listening online that have wandered far away. And they need to come home. Father, we're going to sing this beautiful song that you inspired somebody to write years ago. But it speaks to our hearts. Lord, I'm coming home. 
Lord, I'm coming home, never more to roam. Open wide the arms of love, because, Lord, I'm coming home. Oh, I pray, Father, that you have designated some in this room today to make that quick little trip. It's not far, and it's not hard. I pray that you'll bring them home today. Oh, Father, do it in Jesus' name. And if there is a person here this morning who's not even born again, Lord, would you touch their hearts and speak to them, and would you bring them down one of these aisles to confess faith in Jesus Christ and embrace him as their master and their savior. And finally, have a purpose in life and a peace in life. Father, do your work, we pray. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Let's amen. stand together as we sing.